Hola a todos. Bienvenidos. Welcome. And we're excited to have this conversation with Barbara Oakley. And we thought that this is a great opportunity for everyone to ask questions and for us to learn a little bit more about a topic that the first, I think the first time you talked about this at UFM, a lot of people were saying, oh, I'm definitely a hiker. I'm definitely a slow learner. And we were finally proud to say that. So I was like, oh, we need to talk more about that about fast learners versus slow learners. What are the differences and what can we learn about how we all learn? So welcome, Barbara, and feel free to start us off with maybe talking a little bit about the difference between hikers and race car learners and what do you mean by that? Okay, well, so there's a wonderful book out called Forgetting the Benefits of Not Remembering which you might think, whoa, what's this about? But it's written by a neuroscientist, and he talks about the blessing of not being able to remember things really well. So, for example, if you have a traumatic experience, wouldn't you really like to forget about it? And they often say things like, time heals all wounds. It may not heal all wounds, but it actually does make them a little better. And part of the way it does that is when we, when we remember something, it's simply a connection between neurons, right? So there's this connection, and some of those connections can like fade away. And that's what happens with time, is some of these connections fade away, and you forget things. So, slower learners are often people who, they have sort of a bath of neurochemicals that, you know, they, they learn something like this morning I learned my Spanish vocabulary list. I always like to joke that however many people in the audience, I lose one IQ point for every set of eyes that's staring at me. So, like, I'd love to be able to, you know, to, to speak uh, eloquently in Spanish, but I get very shy when I'm all these eyes. But although I could probably do pretty well with Russian, um, you know, just because it was there from a long time ago. But in any case, when we're slower, slower learners tend to have baths of neurochemicals that don't fix those connections in place and keep them very easily. I have to relearn again in the morning and then relearn again tonight, late at night. I will go back and review and repractice and remake those connections. But the thing is, people who have really, really good memories have a different bath of neurochemicals. They make those connections and those connections don't fall away during the day. They stay there. You might think, oh, that's just great. But here's, here's what can happen with that. You learn something, or let's say you make a connection. You know, this, oh, I am, I have, uh, I've learned about a medical diagnosis, and so I hear these symptoms of a person and I remember what those symptoms are, and I can instantly make a diagnosis. Once I make those connections and I've thought that thought, made the diagnosis, it's really hard for me, as a, with a good memory, to forget those things, to change my mind about what I'm learning. And in fact, there's lots of evidence that people who learn more quickly tend to be less flexible, and they can jump to conclusions and be unable to change their minds. So who are these fast learners that are like this? They're often the ones who are the intellectual elite. The intellectual elite is great for many things, but oftentimes flexibility is not one of those things. Or some, there are some really good learners who can remember things and still be flexible, but they're a little rare. 
So if you think about in your life, oftentimes there are individuals uh, who are your boss, perhaps, or a leader, and you've clearly seen how they're, they're maybe wrong about something, but you also know you can't say anything to that person because they're pretty inflexible. So, um, so I, I tend to like slower learners because they can often, there's good evidence that they're more flexible learners. And my, my typical example that I like to bring up is my favorite scientist of all times, who, who is Santiago Ramon y Cajal. Very slow learner, very bad learner. Uh, as a child, you know, he really struggled. He couldn't learn math very well, he couldn't learn a lot of things very well, but he got, Somewhat motivated in his uh, late teens and early 20s, he wanted to become a doctor. So he became a doctor um, at, with a lot of struggle. It was very hard for him. But uh, then he took a test to become a professor of anatomy. And he failed it. So he took it again the next year. And he failed it. So he took it the one last year that he could take it, and he passed it. So here's this guy, a loser of a learner, really slow. Uh, finally, he becomes a professor of anatomy, and his way of learning was to just really go in and look carefully himself at what he was seeing. So he had no problem with arguing with the top people in the field and saying, no, wait a minute, if you really look at things, this is what's going on. And as he later explained, he was asked, you know, how did a loser like you ever win the Nobel Prize? And you know, now he's the father of modern neuroscience. How did this ever happen? And he said, well, I was no genius. But he said, I have worked with many geniuses. And the problem with geniuses, again, these are these fast learners who can often, they, they learn really quickly, but then they jump to conclusions, and when they're wrong, they can't flexibly change their minds. So he himself worked, um, there was another individual who, who, whose name was Golgai. And, Kamel Gogai was the inventor of a dye that Santiago Ramon y Cajal used to do a lot of his brilliant work, although he took that dye and he made it a lot better so he could see the outlines of neurons. So, uh, so people like Gogai were important in that Gogai did develop this very first dye. But he had ideas about how the brain worked and how our neurons worked that were completely wrong. And he, he, he inflexibly could not change his mind. He thought that it, there weren't individual neurons. It was one gigantic net in your brain of these connected sort of neural materials, which was completely incorrect. He could not change his mind. So now he goes down in history as kind of a bit of a footnote, a bit of a laughing stock, because he, despite profound evidence, he simply refused to look at it. Whereas Cajal could sit there and say, wait a minute, no, I think there's individual neurons. And he was able to, to make these breakthroughs. So, uh, you know, I always say that you can, um, when you're, you don't, if you're not a genius, then you're closer to being someone like Ramon y Cajal. And you too can sometimes make breakthroughs that these genius learners cannot. So uh, I just think it's very important to recognize that slow learning is valuable, not to discount fast learning, especially if you are one of those more rare fast learners who's also quite flexible, like Marie Curie. She was very fast, she could remember things, but she was also very, very much into what do the facts tell me? I will change my mind if the facts tell me that. So uh, 
I think it, as a society, we should be valuing both the slow learners and, and the faster learners, but also recognizing that one of the hardest traits or most difficult aspects of human character to, to grapple with is inflexibility. And, uh, and we, it's important to keep our flexibility and be able to admit mistakes um, when, when we need to. So that's my long uh, rambling introduction to, but I do have to bring up Friedrich Hayek. Um, who, like Santiago Ramon y Cajal, was a very, very slow learner. And he wrote a, a paper about the value of slow learning. And he said, the reason I won the Nobel Prize was I wasn't fast like my colleagues. I, I stumbled over things. But I would really struggle step by step. And I would notice these errors that all the fast learners would just jump right over. And that is, in essence, why I won the Nobel Prize. So I, I think sometimes, uh, you know, such as we value both slow approaches and fast approaches. But we're also, I think, very flexible and willing to, to absorb information that may conflict with how we're thinking about things. And that is what I think UFM uh, is, that's it's one of its greatest qualities, is we, as here, it is encouraged to hear both sides of an argument and really listen and think things through for yourself instead of just accepting um, received wisdom. Thank you, Barbara. And what, what, what do you think are good questions that we can ask ourselves so that we can stay flexible and to make sure that we're not taking things for granted and that we're really seeking the truth? This is a really good question for us to be asking ourselves here. So could, we, um, could you break into groups of three or four um, or five, something like that, and let's take the next five minutes or so, converse among yourselves, see what you conclude for yourselves is the best approach for this. On your mark, get set, five minutes, go. So now we're gonna share. And for sharing, I'm gonna ask if you could raise your hands and we can give you a mic because we're recording this and otherwise we can't hear it afterwards. So who would like to share? What techniques do you have to stay flexible in your learning journeys? Uh, we were discussing that we have totally different approaches. One is uh, for completely memorizing the, the structure. Another one is more organically, more uh, kind of relying on, on your emotions and how it flows maybe with keywords or, or certain topics that look for points that you want to share when you're, you're, you're speaking or you're learning with others. But um, what, what I think uh, that we, we both share is, is uh, with the three of us shared is to, to open up to listen to others. Uh, that's kind of a way of, of, of staying flexible, no matter how your own approach is, but listen to others and how others can do it. It's not that your own way is the only way and the right way but probably the, the, the one that fits you more, which doesn't mean that there are other ways to, to go to the same goal or achieve the same goal. What a, I think that's so insightful. I, I, I know for me, I, I do some of that. I, I especially, I try to, you can't spend all your time looking at things from the perspective of others, but I try to deliberately choose books occasionally that I know are completely antithetical to my thinking, if only to understand how these other ways of thinking arise. And it's, it's amazing how helpful that is. How, uh, more ideas. Hey, um, our group, we talked about it, and what we, the point we reached was that you had to read other, you know, you had to read about the subject in general. 
and just get to know the other per perspectives that you would, not only what you had been taught, mm -hmm. but also just reading about it in general and, you know, finding those other authors that gave you insights and other, you know, made it a broader perspective for what you were learning. So you could take, you know, whatever worked for you, what was best, but just not setting like it was, you know, written in stone, but just, you know, knowing that nobody's holder of the truth, the complete truth, and just learning from, you know, whatever it is that interests you in a broader sense. Yes. To have your own criteria. Yes, very good. Okay, good afternoon. Um, after discussing with our group, uh, we came to the conclusion, it doesn't matter if you are a slow learner or a fast learner. We have to take in consideration that um, all of us are going to reach the same target, okay, the same uh, goal. And we have to take in, in consideration also the multiple intelligences. Yes, yes, which in some sense, I mean, if we look at multiple intelligences, sometimes you get, uh, you'll hear people saying, well, there's, uh, there's no such thing. It's kind of like learning styles, I'll say the same thing. But actually, there's, I just wrote a paper on, yes, there are learning styles. So, uh, um, and I think there's clear evidence that people really look at things in different ways. So, for example, my husband and I, I, I'm an academic. I'm a typical academic in some ways. He likes motorcycles. He flunked out of high school. Uh, he's uh, like the non-academic, and he makes me a stronger person, a better person. He looks at things with a fresh perspective, and I just love that, and he's so smart. Um, he, he did put himself through college, um, you know, so, but I, I think that balancing of perspectives by, by he, ha, he has a very different way of learning, a, a different style of intelligence, you might say, and it is of great value. One thing is, um, have you ever noticed that some really old people, they just don't care to learn anything new and they're really stuck in their ways that they are right. We don't want to be like those people, <laughs> you, you know? So that's part of what you're suggesting, reading, have, uh, expose yourself to people with different perspectives um, and multiple intelligences and ways of looking at things. I just love that, so. Thank you, Barbara. And complementing on this topic of learning styles, we were recommending with, with our group that we are co-workers at the Henry Hazlitt Center, which teaches economy to all the um, degrees at UFM. The radical change that we have experienced in the past 10 years, uh, with how, it, how knowing this had affected our classes. Because knowing that students learn in different ways, have different uh, speeds, different learning styles, implies that uh, we have to create an environment that gives them choice and opportunity to excel. Um, and that is something that it is difficult sometimes because it will be easier if you have one size fits all uh, process. But when you give a space, you can actually see people that otherwise will be like the slow guy of the class flourishing into a very passionate about economics kind of guy. So it's you, you as a professor have a responsibility and the opportunity to give a gift to others that it is to realize that learning uh, has different styles and that you can explore and tinker around. One thing uh, we talked earlier today when we were talking about teaching and learning, we talked about how um, so Often we lack, like for thousands of years, people have thought the only way you learn is through lecture. Then they thought in the last 50 years, oh no, it's active learning, it's only when you're actively doing something. But actually, it's a mixture of me lecturing a little bit and you actively grappling with the material. But I think that's hard for teachers to do because it's, it's actually, it's surprising but it's so much easier to stand up and lecture.
because you're controlling the whole environment. You don't have anybody asking questions of you or, you know, I mean, just a few very carefully defined questions. When you teach some, but then turn it over so that it can be anything coming from, you know, the, the, the students in the classroom, it is so much harder to teach that way. I remember when I switched from just lecture, you know, when I'm lecturing about my circuits or whatever, and then to go to, oh, I lecture a little bit, now they can ask me about anything. Ooh, it's, it's actually, it's much harder to do that. So, um, but it's, it's something that I think really helps in society today to have more creative thinkers, to, to approach things in a more flexible way. Yeah, hello. Uh, so one thing that came up with our group about uh, trying to be flexible is not worry too much about being wrong and not worry too much about what other people think which I just clicked uh, and I imagine that's going to write what you said, must be tough, right? Instead of being a lecturer, be exposing yourself as a teacher and maybe you know, someone asking something you might not have to answer, or you might not be, have the correct answer at that moment. So that can be challenging and scary, I believe, but I think that uh, to remain flexible, you just have to l learn to let go sometimes, that sometimes it's okay to be wrong and then you can change. That, that is such a good and deep point. And part, I think, of what is important for us to realize from what you are bringing out is this idea that we want our students to feel safe and comfortable, but if we tell them we want them to be safe and comfortable, we are actually setting the stage for them to be uncomfortable. Because when we say that, then all of a sudden people start thinking, well, is somebody going to be uncomfortable if I say this? Maybe I shouldn't say this. So I, I, I really like that you brought this up because we do want our students to be really comfortable, but we have to be a little uh, subtle as teachers sometimes in how we do this. I remember one time, um, a student came to me and he said, oh, Mrs. Oakley, I really like your classes. And then he goes, oh, I mean, Dr. Oakley. And I said, you know, I'm just as proud of being Mrs. Oakley as I am of being Dr. Oakley. It's just fine. You could see it was like, oh, thank goodness. She's not trying to make me feel safe by in insisting that she should be called Dr. Oakley. Uh, uh, so, so I think sometimes there's surprising ways, too, to help people feel safer and more comfortable. Uh, and, and, and that's a very, I, I think, in today's environment, I'm just so glad you brought that all, this whole important point up. Hi. Uh, what we talked about is that uh, maybe teaching students how to learn and be very... Uh, individual in the in that point to determine if they're fast learners or slow learners it's it's more important than we than what we thought of before because maybe them knowing and having this metacognition about how they learn can be very uh very, very helpful helpful yeah that's the word that's so i actually i had an exercise that we didn't have time to do today, that where I, I sometimes will do a little in-class test of what your, uh, what your working memory capacity is. So you can see that in a typical classroom, it can vary from people who can hold like a few things in working memory to people who can hold a lot in working memory. And I still remember though, uh, so there are these dramatic differences in how people learn and how working memory has a lot to do with how, how fast you can learn. Um, but what is kind of funny is um, I remember uh, uh, one critic of my book who I asked to read it, you know, and I always solicit input from people I know will not like what I'm writing. I get great feedback that way. And he said, 
oh, how dare you talk about slow learners with lesser working memory capacity because it's really racist. And I said, well, oh, really? Well, guess what? I'm a, a lesser capacity working memory person. So if I'm racist, I'm racist against myself. But that helped me to understand what uh, people who didn't like what I was going to say, what kind of um, you know, attacks they would use, how they would react to what I was doing. And so that's a big reason that I bring out the fact that I have a lesser capacity of working memory, and you know what? I'm proud of it. it. It is part of what helps me be so creative. But if I hadn't been actively trying to get opinions that I knew would be from people who would be finding, trying to find ways to not like what I was doing, I wouldn't have been so aware of, of you know, how to present things in a way that you know, we can all understand how they're really useful ideas, especially in learning. So, um, uh, yes, I think deliberately going out of your way to solicit criticism is really difficult to do sometimes. But, man, the feedback you get is so much more valuable than people, from people who just agree with you on everything. Hi. Uh, we, know, we were talking about how, how hard it is to work with this generation. They have a lot of information coming from everywhere, and now they are always saying, no, you're not okay, teacher. I Google it, and you're wrong <laughs> on class. And now we have to be more prepared every time, so that's what, what we were talking about. And they are even faster now, but it's harder for them to keep the information because they have so many information that they, oh, yeah, TikTok, one, one minute, uh, 15 seconds, uh, nah, it's okay, I pass, I pass. So it's the same when we are teaching. So now we are trying to do better, but it's harder for us because we are also learning how to deal with them. Yes, such good points. So f for me, here's what I do as a teacher in classes. I will often, I'll, I'll present sort of like how, how you might do a problem, then I give it to them so they have to do actively work together and solve problems. The great thing about this is, number one, they know that they're going to actively be working on the problem together, so they have to pay attention. And then when, they're, when I turn them loose to work on the problem, they're working actively together. And all of this, they don't have time to go and check online and see, them, see if I'm wrong about something. So it, it actually it really keeps them focused. And I, I do have to laugh because sometimes people will complain about, teachers will be like, oh, my students are off looking at laptops or doing something different in classes. But if you do have them, you know, so they know they have to be working problems together with small groups, kind of like, like what we just broke out and did, it keeps them, um, like, actively paying attention to what you're saying because they don't, you know, they, they know they're going to go off and work together. But it keeps them from, you know, like, looking up stuff to to like mess with you and argue with you and so forth, which, which makes it a little bit easier, I think, sometimes. Good points. Yes. To add to the previous comment, um, I, I, I really like a lot the collab um, structure that we are more than teachers, we are facilitators. Yes. Because is that, of course, we don't hold all the information and, and like you said, the, the speed of, of of everything is so quick that we cannot compete with that. But how about if we can lead or guide these, uh, these students or these young people to ask the right questions as we have discussed in other platforms, which is more about, I mean, do the right questions. What are you going to find on the, on the, on the web? What are you going to find on the social media? Because there's a lot over there, but that doesn't mean it's, the, it's, it's actually accurate. 
it's truth or, or it's actually knowledge. So it's about processing what, what you're seeing here, books, um, lectures, uh, the, you know, this, this kind of dialogues, uh, so Socratic dialogues, and this exchange and traders of, of, of knowledge that you can bring up your, um, the opportunities of, of what college or university is. That, that's such an important point because a lot of times, like when we teach using the Socratic method, we like to think it's all, you know, the students are coming up with things. But the questions we ask as teachers make an enormous difference. When you're bringing up, just as you did, uh, hey, is Wikipedia really a good source? If, if, you're, if you don't have a good teacher who is bringing up these kinds of Socratic questions, the students really won't learn nearly as well as, you know, so teachers really are important. It's not just all student-centered. It really is both who, who play such an important role. Yeah, I think something else that helps me or that really helped me when I was in college to keep my mind flexible or at least to try to do that was, and this is a book you recommended about, uh, from Kuhn on scientific revolutions. Oh, yes. So to me, studying and learning about the Copernican revolution was mind blowing because I realized, wow, all these people thought they were right for years. And it's the same thing with Ramon y Cajal. Um, everyone who came before him really thought they understood how the brain works and there's nothing else that we can learn. And he thinks something different and somebody comes up with a different theory. And it takes years for that new theory um, to become the new truth or the new theory that everyone believes in. And it's not like I don't believe in objective truth, but it really opened my mind to question the things that I was learning and to question what I thought and where it came from. This is why she's such an important and valued member of the UFM community. <laughs> it's. Um, one thing, so that brings to mind ChatGPT. You can use this, I mean, I'm just like overwhelmed with how, with what a novel and creative new way of thinking that this is bringing to us. A lot of times, so when Gary Kasparov, who was one of the world leading, you know, he was the grandmaster of chess and he lost to Big Blue, um, and what he said and what he has written about the world of chess is that it is growing and developing because you have these massive intellects in chess who are now also using results from AI to inform their, so it's like a combination of more creativity, both from people who are using that creative insight that uh, artificial intelligence is providing. So now we can use ChatGPT as a devil's advocate. If we're thinking about something, you know, can you criticize me? What, write a paper about something? Ask for it to criticize you. It will come up with really good criticisms. So, uh, you know, we have a built-in, um, you know, sort of adversary who we can play off of, but we also have to be aware that this adversary has been trained through a, it's leaning one way. So it will, uh, it, it will be a little biased if you are asking certain questions. Actually, it will be quite biased, but it truly, ChatGPT can be a great way in some sense to also have, uh, be able to argue cogently and understand some different perspectives. Great. I have a question. What do you think about labeling people or labeling ourselves as slow, oh, I'm a slow learner or I'm a fast learner? I mean, I guess it's more than a label. If we have a working memory capacity that's higher or lower than other people, we can label ourselves, but um, what do you think about that and whether we should even talk about this in class or not? What do you think about that in general? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, 
for me, I grew up moving around a lot, so that meant that um, when people, um, you know, by the time I hit my teens, I was always an outsider because I'd always just move to wherever. Then just as I'd fit in, we'd move again and move again. So I got used to being um, sort of an outsider, which meant that when I had differing perspectives, I could handle that. So when somebody labels me with something negative, I'm just like, bring it on. Yeah, you know, because I realized that this negative label actually helped me to be able to think more independently. So, you know, for me, labels are like, you know, that's what you think, whatever, bring it on, it's okay. If you have a bad label for me, that's better for me because I'll surprise you. Uh, um, but um, I do think that, um, you know, we do, we have to be a little careful with our students in that they can end up labeling themselves and they don't have this frame like I have. You know, I have a framework where I flip the label around and if you call me something bad, I'm like, I, in fact, uh, who is the great uh, Charles uh, Barkley? When he gets in front of a basketball, you know, and he gets booed, he plays better. So there are some people who just, when they are negatively, you know, stereotyped or whatever, they do better. So I think that's a powerful frame to develop for yourself. But uh, uh, at the same time, for students, um, I, you know, sometimes they just need encouragement. I, and I remember, I, I still remember one of my students, and she had taken the class that I was teaching previously and she'd flunked it and so then she had to take it again. And she was so just, you know, she was devastated. And, and she was like, and I think that the professor had been really not a very friendly professor. So I don't, this probably should turn off the camera. So this was bad of me. But I knew, I knew she knew the material. So I just waited, all the students did the first test you know, and then uh, I looked over at her and she was still sitting there and she was crying and all the students had left. So I just kind of went over and did the Socratic method, you know. Well, what, what about this? What, what's this? Well, she knew it all. So within, you know, like 20 minutes, she had completed the test with, you know, just a few Socratic questions. Do you know that through the rest of that whole class, she soared? I never had to coach her again, never had to, and she was uh, one of the top students in the class. So sometimes you just need a little bit of extra uh, encouragement when you're, uh, you know, it's a tough time in life. And, and we as teachers want to inspire and motivate our students. So uh, I think it's okay to, to do a little special. Yes, Rebecca. Does it make a difference? If the topic is really not, like, let's say a student who thinks he's bad at math, does it affect his capacity to learn if he has this, you know, he's like a, I don't know, dislike for the topic? Yes. Your liking or disliking of a topic makes an enormous difference in how well you can learn it. But at the same time, you need to be aware that you can dislike it and you can still learn it. You know, it's just harder because you're not liking it, you're trudging along. But the further you go, the easier it can get. So it's kind of, uh, one, um, there's a brilliant paper about neural schemas, and the authors of this paper, which is long-term memory, the development of long-term memory with expertise. But he says um, that we are motivated to study what we are good at, but some things take longer to get good at. So, for example, for me, learning in math and science, it took it was really longer for me to get good at this. But once I started to kind of get better, then I really started doing better. 
And, and I think that's a problem that we have now with teachers is we, we'll say, we, have, we do not have enough science, technology, engineering, and math experts in society, so let's make it really fun so we will attract students in it. This is like saying, I want you to learn air guitar. I want you to just get up in front of the audience and feel how it feels to be playing air guitar. Isn't it cool? You feel like you're really... But students don't feel inside that they're really learning the, the guitar. So it might be fun for a little bit, but it's not really fun. True fun often involves like you're trudging up a hill for a little while. It, it's harder. And for, I've talked with, for example, uh, those teaching computer science in high school. And when the students are first learning, they're like, I can't do this. This is not me. I, I don't know how to program. I don't know. And there's several weeks where they're really struggling the, with the material. And then it clicks. And they suddenly become, wow, you know I can do this. And so uh, motivation is a funny, funny thing. Oftentimes, you just, you know, for example, with our daughters, um, I, I wanted to ensure that they had all doors open for them in studying and in being capable in math as well as everything else. And um, so I put them in Kuman Mathematics for 10 years, 20 minutes a day of a little extra practice with math. Our, our older daughter was always terrible at math, but she got better and better, and then she finished her medical school residency at Stanford. You know, so, I mean, this little girl who was terrible at math, but our, our younger daughter was always thought of herself as an artist, you know, and so she loved art. That's what she wanted to study. So I'm not kidding you. It was 10 years of just... 20, those 20 minutes of extra math study a day, it was always a fight. And you know what? She's now got her master's in statistics. She loves math. And, you know, so if I just sort of went by what she was motivated to want to, she wouldn't have the absolutely phenomenal career. I don't even understand what she's doing, but it's like really high level. And they just doubled her salary and said, look, come here and we'll even pay for you to stay here and so forth. Just because she's really, really good at, you know, so keep going. You know, even if uh, students aren't motivated, it's amazing what can happen as they gradually get better. And some things really do take longer to get better at. I just want to comment that that's something I really like about your work and it's how you can help and how you help so many people become better learners. And this is because we usually think of fast learners as, for instance, and we see this at UFM all the time. When somebody comes from these schools where the students are usually really good at math and they're really good at math in the first years of college, but then as the complexity of other learning increases, and they don't really have good study habits, they start flunking, even though they're these really fast learners. And then on the other hand, you have students who really struggle, and they might really struggle at first, but then because of their good study habits, they persist and they become really good in class. So I really like that. Oh, that's such work. a good point. Actually, one of the biggest problems that, uh, that the administrators at Harvard and MIT have to deal with is our students who are really fast learners in high school, they come and because they're fast learners, they don't learn good study habits. So they, they, uh, they will go there, They've, they're fast, they can cram at the last minute, but that cramming at the last minute doesn't form strong neural pathways that will stay there through the, the years to come. And so they, they just haven't practiced with time management and, you know, doing their learning um, in a, a more structured way. If you have five hours to, to learn something, let's say you've got, you know, five hours in a week to study French or, uh, you know, or economics, whatever you're studying, space that learning out one hour per day over five days instead of five hours in one day. Because then you will learn 
and sleep. And sleep reinforces the learning. Learn and sleep. Sleep reinforces. So you get like twice the effort for that one hour, and it really is helpful for you. So that spaced repetition, stretching out your learning, um, if you can learn that at a young age, you will be successful when you go to Harvard, MIT, or wherever, where you're competing with uh, all these other, you know, very, very fast learners. Just a, a tiny comment and question. So uh, for me, usually I think fast, good, slow, bad, but then I remind about my love for food. So fast food, no good, slow food, great. So yeah. <laughs> I think that is what you're describing. <laughs> Yep. Uh, so we're not in the fast food business. Yes. Um, so my question, um, and it has a little bit to do with food, is regarding the neurochemical composition of our brain and how that affects our uh, learning and our learning capacity, our learning ability, our learning style. What happens uh, when you have depression, anxiety, or you have, uh, or you're in love, or have a, a hard breakup? Is there a way to hack your neurochemical uh, composition? Is it is it even advisable? Oh, so that is a question that I wish I had two hours to answer, uh, but I think we have three minutes. Yeah, uh, <laughs> But it's a wonderful, wonderful question. So I want to, um, we often think that when we're learning, it's just that's all mental stuff. But actually, it's really important for, um, for example, if you exercise, exercise is a really important, um, what it does is when you exercise, it sprinkles into the brain a substance called brain-derived neurotropic factor which is like a fertilizer for those connections between neurons. And you can actually see, it's like all these little sprouts come out and want to connect. And they're kind of like, if you exercise, it, it, you know, it's like, hey, I'm here, I'm out, I'm ready to learn. Um, and they find, for example, that athletes during their athletic season, when they have much less time to learn, are actually, they do better on tests. So um, exercise is a really important part of learning. You know, it, I mean, it's a good compliment. Is it going to make you into a super genius? No, because then Olympic athletes would also all be, you know, Nobel Prize winners, um, and that just doesn't happen. But will it optimize whatever your learning capacity is if you are also doing good exercise? Absolutely. So exercise helps. Um, if, so, so depression is a whole other topic, but I will touch briefly on it. And I, I'm sorry, but I just can't do justice to love tonight. But that is really an amazing, uh, sort of, it can be a strong motivator for all sorts of things. But, uh, if you look at different kinds of, um, meditation, if you have mantra focus style meditation, so you're focusing on a mantra, what some people find when they get depressed, you get very anxious. Your thoughts go into default mode network, which is like mind wandering, and you mind wander about anxious things. So if you are this kind of person who gets very anxious about um, you know, what could all sorts of negative things that happen, mantra style meditation can be helpful for you. The trade-off is that that anxious, you know, mind wandering can also be a source of creativity. So, uh, you, you know, you have to kind of balance that a little bit. Uh, so there's trade-offs to everything, uh, but very, very good question. I just have a quick question about motivation that you already talked about a little bit. But um, uh, when you were talking, I just remembered when I was in eighth grade, um, I remember that I lost my dad and I just had one teacher that really motivated me by being empathy. That that's not like m common here in Guatemala. I mean, in, when I was in college, none of my teachers, none, none of my professors were empathy to me. So my question is, do you think that uh, you can motivate a kid by being empathy to him? Oh, that's, yes, yes, yes. Can you do this for every child all the time? 
you know, you do have to realize that there's, there's going to be trade-offs, you know, um, as far as you also want to not forget your own family, you know, if you're a teacher. But see, when I am excited about something, when I am empathetic about something, I, my neural patterns are resonating through your mirror neuron system. So what I am expressing to you with my facial expressions, my gestures, is actually mirrored in your own, um, in your own brain and helps you feel better. So it, um, it's, it's a really, um, if you think back on all the best teachers you ever had, they were often people who were really enormously passionate and enthusiastic about what they were teaching. And in that sense, they were really empathizing with what you were doing. They know now, like if you give Botox injections, it paralyzes certain muscles of your face. So what that means is you can't smile. I mean, I mean, you can't frown. So you can't frown as easily. You smile more. And they found that that makes you happier. I mean, because you can't frown. It makes you happier. And it also is similarly echoed in the people who you are you know, teaching. So um, our, we often forget it, but one of our deepest and best things that we can do as teachers, besides being competent in the subject, is to be excited about it. Because the way we're excited and, uh, and our hand gestures and our facial uh, expressions are echoed in the person, and like you almost certainly felt better for being around someone who could actually not only empathize with your your feelings, but boost your feelings, uh, you know, to to lift your spirits. And so I am I am grateful to your teacher today, and I am grateful to all of you for the great great value that you give to those you love and those you are teaching. So thank you so much for this wonderful evening together.